Hello everybody and welcome to the channel. In today's video, we have a fantastic presentation by esteemed astrologer Margaret Gray titled Relationship Astrology and Compatibility. If you would like to view our current class, workshop and webinar offerings, please visit keplercollege.org. And without further ado, let's get into the video. Margaret has been a consulting and teaching astrologer for over 30 years. She is currently based in her native Dublin, although part of her heart remains in Hawaii. We were just talking about that before. That's quite a distance between Dublin, Ireland and Hawaii. <laughs> yes, but they're both little islands. Just one is a little hotter and warmer than the other, yes. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. Margaret offers birth chart readings to clients internationally, as well as presentations at astrology conferences worldwide. Margaret's work is grounded in a Jungian-based psychological approach. She is passionate about the astrology of relationships, and the co-founder of Relationships and Astrology, which offers certificate courses and webinars in the astrology of relationships. Margaret has also set up and co-runs Astrology Island. She is a practicing psychotherapist and works extensively with couples. And you can find more about Margaret's work at astrologypsychological.com. So Margaret, I'm so delighted to introduce you today and I'm gonna to pass on the baton to you. Thank you so much, Callum and Laurie, for having me here. It's such a joy to be back with Kepler. I was just saying that um, I taught several courses for Kepler several years ago, and um, we're just talking about me doing a course on psychological astrology, an introductory course. So very much looking forward to that. So let me just get myself set up here. And let's see, is that working, Callum? Looks beautiful. Yep, I can see the, the movement in the background. Fantastic. Fantastic. I thought I'd make it nice Barbie pinky for the <laughs> topic we're looking at today. And um, just to say that if I suddenly go silent, it's because I'm taking a sip of water. I'm just getting over the tail end of a cold, so my throat might get a little um, croaky. So welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here from every corner of the globe to talk about the topic of relationship astrology and compatibility. Will you be my Valentine? So let's dive into this. So because I live in Dublin, um, which is in fact the city where there are some of the relics of St. Valentine's, they're buried in Whitefriars Chapel, which is this chapel, in fact, I passed it yesterday as I was driving by, I always wondered where did this feast day come from? And apparently under the Roman Emperor Claudius, young people were forbidden to marry because they, he believed that soldiers would fight better if they were unmarried. However, there was a Christian priest who was called Valentine who secretly married them in the church. Eventually he was caught and of course killed by Claudius, but before his death, he healed the daughter of one of the judges who was actually putting him to death and left her a note signed from your Valentine. Since then, Father Valentine became Saint Valentine and is known as the patron saint of lovers. So that's actually an image of within the church. If you're ever in Dublin, do pop in. It's a gorgeous old church. I'm not a religious person by any means, but I do love old churches. And these are apparently the relics of Saint Valentine. So there's a little bit of interesting background. So this is the Disney version of relationships. And the message is, we just need to find the right person, your right person, the only person. How many times have you heard people say, oh, there's somebody out there for you? And the question is, but who is the right person? And what makes them the right person for us? And of course, that can change over time. It depends very much where we're at. So today we're going to look at how astrology can help us figure out what compatibility might mean for each of us and for our clients so that when they come in and ask that question, we can help them with it. I love looking at definitions of words. I think they're very interesting how they get used and misused over time. And when I looked at this definition, capable of existing together in harmony, this really out of these three definitions seems to be the only one that is remotely applicable in relationships. So effectively, just consider the fact that we're really using a word, the term compatibility, that doesn't really fit when we're looking at relationships. 
And if we look at the definition, the second definition, it's it's actually unhelpful because it says something that isn't altered by interaction. We know that we are all altered by all our interactions, however small or big, and that we do modify ourselves and the relationship gets modified through our interaction. So really a lot of this definition is not applicable. So let's focus on number one, capable of existing together in harmony. So a lot depends on why we want to be in a relationship at this point in our life. Is it for companionship? In which case harmony sounds like a reasonable goal or is it about passion? And if so, what kind of passion and why? Is it mere desire or to go beyond our limits? And again, we have to ask, is relationship the way we can find this? Because passion can be found in a lot of things. A lot of us are very passionate about astrology. Is it about healing past hurts, maybe childhood hurts, redoing certain patterns? If so, when will we know if we've healed? Is it about growth? What kind of growth? Or is it about mirroring, mirroring some aspects of ourselves that we know we can't see? So as astrologers, when we're asked by clients, am I compatible with this person? We need to ask in a lot of detail, what does that mean for you at this point in time? There's a lot of things that astrology doesn't tell us, even though as astrologers, we like to believe it tells us everything. But there are some things it doesn't tell us. So let's have a look what some of these are. First of all, how self-aware is somebody? How much work have they done in themselves, their childhood, their past relationships? Are they still doing the work? Because really, it's a work in progress for all of us. Are they aware and honest about their gaps? So we can look at somebody's chart, but we don't know what they've really done with that. Big question of emotional intelligence. We know lots of people who are incredibly intellectually intelligent and lots of people who are very connected with their emotions. But how many people can connect both together? How well are their Mercury and Moon communicating? Consciousness, very similar to self-awareness. How conscious is somebody? Or is somebody like a walking bunch of Facebook memes? We don't know. We don't know how much somebody has inhabited their sun and the rest of their chart. Have they even gone through the process of separation and individuation? From the chart itself, we don't know that. How open is somebody's heart? Have they recovered from past hurts? Having lots of water in a chart doesn't mean somebody's heart is open. Remember that water freezes when it's hurt. And I've often heard astrologers say, oh, but there's so much water in the chart. That does not mean somebody's heart is open. So just to keep that in mind. Courage. How brave is somebody? Relationships require enormous courage to be vulnerable and exposed. The courage to be hurt, to get ourselves back together, and to try again. How integrated is somebody's Mars? How have they experienced it? What happened to their Mars at their Mars return age two? These are all questions. These are all the things we're interested in finding out when the client is sitting in front of us. Resilience is the first cousin of courage. And some people are very courageous, but they don't have the necessary resilience. A strong Mars in a chart won't tell us really about resilience. Even the aspects to it can show us the potential, but not how the person might have experienced it. Very important. One of the key things to look out for when we're talking to clients is the resilience and how they might help build that up. Sense of humor. Do they have a good sense of humor towards themselves and life's quirks? Even looking at the elemental balance won't tell us that. There's lots of factors like culture. I mean, I'm half Italian and sense of humor in Italy means something very different than in Ireland where I grew up. Sexual chemistry for romantic relationships. 
there's something outside ourselves, something outside the chart that somehow seems to spark sexual chemistry with somebody. We can look at two or three charts and think, gosh, they probably will get on together and they probably would. But we cannot tell from the chart, is there going to be that that X factor that is going to create that sexual connection? And of course, love. That is a deeper issue of who we are, how we love ourselves and others. For some, it's connected to spiritualities. For others, spirituality. For others, it's about being of service. We cannot see it in the chart. So really what we're doing is we are helping client, clients join the dots. Also very hard to see, is this a soulmate, a twin soul relationship? And I talk about this when I do the relationship and astrology course in level three. And all I can talk about is the research that might show possibilities. But actually, we don't know that. So some other factors to keep in mind when we're looking at the theme of compatibility. Developmental stages. Think back to when you were an adolescent. Think back to what compatibility meant to you then. Hormones are raging, also going through kind of Jupiter, Sat Jupiter, Saturn transits, pull, push, freedom, boundaries, initial Uranus transits, all encouraging us to separate from our family, to find our tribe outside, to develop a sense of our own identity and exploring and explore our sexuality. So compare that to the difference of compatibility at the first Saturn return, at midlife, at the Chiron return, and at the second Saturn return, and in later years. So all of this has to be seen in the context of what's going on for the person. Plus, often as astrologers, we don't consider necessarily the wider cultural, financial, political, and environmental factors. What is allowed? In some cultures, being gay is still it means imprisonment. So there are lots of different factors that come into the picture. If somebody is starving and trying to get a roof over their head and food on the table, that's going to have a whole different compatibility is going to have a whole different meaning. Also consider that, you know, relationships up to not so long ago in many cultures and still are, were a financial contract. Even in Ireland, it wasn't that long ago that people got married on the basis of land exchanges. So to maintain property and land in the family. So let's look at the compatibility menu. What can we actually help clients with? What are some of the ingredients on this astrological menu that can help us support our clients in getting a sense of what they are looking for with compatibility? The first one, of course, is the elements, always the elemental balance. Personal planets, Sun, Moon, Mercury, Venus and Mars. Saturn is very important in terms of boundaries. And these are expressed via the individual chart, synastry, and the composite chart. So this is what we're going to be looking at together today with some example charts. I love this quote because it's a little reminder, courtesy of Tolstoy, that committed relationships, regar regardless of whether it's marriage or not, if they're like life, most of our experiences come from how we deal with the challenges, not the smooth part. So I always describe my work as a relationship astrologer and as a couple psychotherapy as being the bridge maker. That's what I do. I, I help couples to find dots that they can connect up into a bridge. And I think that's really a very big part of the function of relationship astrology, how to deal with what we consider incompatibility. Okay, so compatibility. But by the way, I will stop um, in a few slides time if you have any questions. And if there are any urgent questions, please do put them in the chat box and Laurie and Callum will um, interrupt me if need be, if there's anything urgent. So please feel free to stop me at any point, but I will also stop during the presentation so you can ask any questions. So when we look at 
compatibility, similarities and differences. First of all, the question that often comes up, do similar energies create familiarities to opposite attract? So here we're really in the realms of the elements. And we know that, that fire and air have similarities versus water and earth. But what we need to ask, does lots of similarities create a sense of familiarity? And is that good or is it too much? Because it reminds us of our family of origin, literally the term familiarity. So that may well depend on the chart and the nature of the relationship, as well as where we're looking at in a chart. I mean, for friendships, we like similarity. That kind of creates a sense of comfort, a sense of ease. And our moon likes familiarity, even in intimate relationships, because we associate that with safety. And because it's challenging to translate emotional needs when we're feeling very vulnerable. However, very fiery and airy charts are much more likely to enjoy difference because it's associated with excitement and a challenge with learning. So we need to kind of be familiar with the nature of the chart to know. So the question, of course, becomes as well, when do energies become too different and feel exhausting and challenging rather than growthful? Because there is something about the attraction of opposites, the attraction of people who are very different to us, that there's a fascination. But how opposite is opposite? Where are we in? And it depends where we are in our lives at that time, how much energy we have to put into the relationship. And we tend to assume that pre-Saturn return and immediate post-Saturn return couples have more energy than post-second Saturn return relationships. Yet keep in mind that at your first Saturn return, a lot of the focus is often on shining your solar light, building your career. So that, in fact, there may be a tendency at times to feel this is too much hard work. So too many differences are exhausting. Post-Saturn return, there actually may be more time and energy and a desire to learn things about ourselves in this third phase of life that maybe we haven't had a chance to do before. So, in fact, we may find ourselves as we get older being attracted to people who are quite opposite to us and quite different. As long as usually we have a sense of connection with our friendships, where we have that sense of familiarity. So let's take a look at the elemental balance in charts. Fire and air, earth and water, as I talked about, have, this is basic astrology 101, but we don't always apply it to our daily interactions. So we're looking at the overall balance, how we cope with life. Let me go back a step. Fire and air we know have similarities of speed, of boredom thresholds that really do impact relationships. I mean, fire, and I'm talking in general terms for the chart, but fire likes adventure and air likes communication. So these are the signs that are likely to be the chattier signs. Earth and water tend to really prioritize security and stability. So they tend to be a little quieter often, wanting practical things. They, those grand romantic gestures are all well and good, but actually they also want something to show for it, something kind of practical to show and something romantic as well. So what is our elemental balance like? We're going to be looking at that. How do we approach and deal with life? If the elemental balance is very different, we might learn from each other. And again, that's exciting, but it may feel too incongruous for us. If the gaps are the same and an element is missing, then we're both going to need to find it somewhere else, maybe through children or through creativity or through the composite chart. We have to be careful not to rely on the other person to fill that missing element. Let me just take a sip of water. The moon is our emotional needs. With the moon, we cannot really compromise. If our emotional needs are not met in um, a close friendship or in an intimate relationship, eventually the relationship is going to corrode and erode because it's unlikely that we will feel comfortable and feel loved and feel emotionally heard. Often I have clients coming to me in psychotherapy and they say, I don't feel heard by the other person. And initially I'm thinking they're talking about Mercury, but actually when we look a little deeper, 
it's the moon they don't feel somebody gets them emotionally and that's pretty crucial and very important mercury how we communicate next to the moon very important um, very challenging to deal with in relationship when there are huge differences. That's when you get people saying, you know, it's like we're 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 missing each other completely. We're we're saying things, but it's like as if my my significant other is talking a different language. And often, of course, there are also different language issues to overcome. So when there are different Mercuries and different languages, there's even more of a need to really work with that. And we're going to talk in a minute about creating bridges there. Mars by element, our passion, what turns us on, and how we resolve conflicts. So this can still impact us, but it's easier to create a bridge across these differences. And I do talk, I will, we are all talking about this in a lot more detail on the relationship and astrology intensive next weekend. So it's something you're interested in, please do join us because we're going to be talking in great depth about all of this. So let's have a look also quickly at modalities. Modalities do matter to some degree because some modalities tend to, there's a little bit of friction. It's a cardinal sign with a cardinal sign. I'm in charge. No, I'm in charge. And again, this mightn't come up in the initial stages of a relationship because we're all so busy liking everything the other person likes, even if six months down the road, we're thinking, why did I say I love train journeys when actually I really want to drive? But with two cardinal signs, you kind of start realizing like, you know, I want my way and I want my way. Fixed, fixed signs, no changes, please. So that can be a stuckness can happen. A sense of like, you know, we're not moving from here. That can work for some people. Again, depends where you're at. But for some people, it might be like, oh, at some point, it's like, gosh, there's no growth here. That doesn't mean you can't have a relationship with the same modality but just be aware that these are the things that can come up and that may just arise and matter more in early developmental stages but you know later on may not be so problematic mutable to mutable sign who's going to make the decision here you could have you know a couple or a trouble or a group who are like nobody's making a decision nothing happens and that can get again it's like there's a stalemate there so it's really just keeping those things in mind i'm going to stop briefly for a moment to see are there any urgent questions callum and laurie that you want me to address yes we do we have some questions coming in so one of the first ones here any specific placements for those who are loners or we might also say maybe independents as well any thoughts you know, again, I think that's one of the things that astrology really can't tell us. What I will say is that in my experience, um, fire and air signs tend to be naturally very independent. I mean, if you think of, you know, fire signs like Leo and Aries, part of the life journey of a fire sign is to develop one's independence. Also, the placements of the nodes can be interesting. A north node in a fire sign is about developing that. That doesn't mean you have to be on your own, but it means that if you are on your own, maybe it's because you've chosen to do that and be on your life journey. It's also charts that are more introverted, and sometimes that's the moon. Moon and water signs can really, you know, really, really need to kind of connect only with a handful of people that it feels very emotionally connected. And sometimes it needs a lot of space to release other people's energies. So I think there's a lot of factors involved in why some people choose to be on their own, prefer to be on their own, and why other people learn through relationships. And I really believe ultimately it's all about what is best for our learning, for our what what have we chosen to learn through on this planet? I'd also say that if people have a lot of planets in the relationship houses, particularly the seventh house and the eighth house, then relationships are going to be a great learning arena. But that might be through close friendships. It doesn't have to be through intimate sexual relationships. So I think it's a mixture of factors. Wonderful. And there's a question here on longevity. So astrologically speaking, what keeps people together? That is a great question. And, you know, again, there are so many answers to that. The very short answer is that certainly Saturn, Sun, sinistry aspects can help with longevity. But that's, you know, if 
if longevity is a plus factor, because sometimes those Saturn Sun um, cross aspects can be a little challenging to then break away. And I mean, longevity also, what is longevity? How long is a piece of string? For one couple, longevity might be six months and that's wonderful. They've learned what they needed from each other and it's time to move on. And for other people, it's being together for life and the same for friendships. I mean, I have some friends that I've had since I was four years old and I hope we'll be together, you know, we'll be friends forever. But then there are other friendships that lasted a couple of years and then they finished and they were just as valuable. They were just short term. So I think it depends on a lot of factors, really, what longevity is. And I I understand that, you know, when we're starting off in a new relationship, there can be a little bit of kind of anxiety. But I think usually when I work with people, I really help them to see back to the resilience that regardless of how long or short this relationship is, you're going to be OK. I think that's the really important thing. And you're going to have learned something incredibly valuable that is going to stay with you forever, regardless of what the relationship was about. Wonderful. And do you use traditional or modern rulers? I use modern rulers. I'm a modern psychological astrologer, so I use modern rulers. Wonderful. And how do you see the role of Venus and Jupiter placements in terms of maybe synastry factoring into relationships? Bear with me, I will come on to that. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Perfect question. I love it. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, I think we'll stop here and then we'll come back to the questions a bit further on. But thank you very much. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Great questions. Okay, let's talk about sun sign compatibility. So the image here is me when I am asked this at parties, am I compatible with this sun sign? And all of us who are as astrologers have come across that question multiple times. And I was asked this question um, about a year ago when I was on a TV breakfast show here in Ireland and I tried to gently stir them away into moon signs about as tactfully as an airy sun can do while my eyes were rolling in my head because I thought why 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 are you asking me this but we do people ask do Scorpios and Aquarians get along are Virgo and Taurus a match made in heaven or so yes sun signs and similar elements fire and air for example can feel easy and appealing that can work great in friendships with colleagues we know that the sun is our identity, who we're becoming, where we're headed. So of course the sun matters in relationship compatibility in so far as there is someone home to have a relationship with. So in so far as the person knows they have a sun sign and are working with it. But once we've established that the person has done at least some of the basic work in terms of separation and individuation, we also know as astrologers that there are multiple avenues for them to continue this work for themselves. Vocation is a key one. So as long as a relationship doesn't attempt to block the expression of our creative self, then even if the other person's expression is very different to ours, we can both thrive. A musician can thrive with an accountant. It doesn't matter. So Again, this often depends on developmental stage. If we're around the first Saturn return and around midlife transits, it might feel very challenging if our partner is not supportive, at least supportive, of our career and vocation and of the different things that we do to express ourselves. So remember that expressing our son gives us vitality and a relationship is rarely enough to meet those needs. So it's a work in progress for all of us. Um, and for some of us, of course, who are astrologers who have some Saturn aspects or a strong Virgo, our vocation is probably going to matter until the day we drop. So our partners need to know that. Um, I keep being amazed when my non-astrology friends are increasingly retiring and talking about playing golf and my work is amping up. So all depends where you're at. Keep that in mind. Lunar compatibility. Here we are in deal breaker territory in my personal view, because so much hurt could be avoided if we just focused on moon signs before jumping into romantic relationships. We know that the moon in our chart describes how we experience and how we process our emotions, as well as what our emotional needs are and how we want them met. Our moon also describes our ability to self-regulate and self-soothe, which is crucial in relationships. 
if we don't know what our emotional needs are, we cannot meet them in ourselves and we can't use our mercury to express them with others. So we can end up in a situation where we expect the other person to know without us ever asking or expressing it what they want. So a very much a fantasy is that the other, if the other person loves us, and I have heard this, if the other person loves me, they will know my feelings and needs without me saying them. This brings us to early attachment. As astrologers, we can look at the progressions to the moon to find out what happens and i cover this again a great deal in the relationship and astrology intensive but just keep that in mind early attachment issues are important we look at these in some of the example charts compatibility is very important uh, it's a necessary requirement for interest intimacy our feelings and needs being understood and being met creates safety if we are either unable or unwilling to be emotionally vulnerable with another person or we feel unsafe to do so with them, then we are unlikely to be able to have an ongoing relationship of any kind. That includes friendship. So do we need the same moon or aspects? Not necessarily, but there needs to be a mutual understanding, an ability to reciprocate lunar needs. For example, if your moon is an Aquarius, um, then you're more likely to feel understood by somebody with their moon in Aries than with somebody's moon in Scorpio. Even a Uranus aspect, the moon in Scorpio, is not going to feel the same as the moon in Aquarius because it's an overlay. So the moon in Scorpio wants depth, emotional connection. The moon in Aquarius is much more general and surface and friendship based. That's a vast generalization. Can we form a bridge? Absolutely. And it all depends on the rest of the chart. However, over the long term, it may not be enough. So keep that in mind. So some more things. Lunar attraction is felt. We feel a connection with somebody. Think of the last time you were with a group of people and you felt yourself drawn and felt really safe with somebody. That was the lunar attraction, chances are very very important compatibility provides a sense of comfort very important when we're going through rough times um we when when we're going through a rough patch say somebody has lost their job or the house has been remortgaged or there's all kinds of difficulties with children or with family members or whatever it's harder than to say hey this is what i need so if the other person knows us well enough and is able to put their own lunar needs aside or has similar lunar needs it's going to be much easier to connect with us at that level for example if somebody's gone through bereavement a moon in scorpio wants empathy a moon in taurus probably wants a hug and some nice food and a moon in aquarius might want to go online for a while so those differences can easily be misunderstood as not caring. Differences can feel challenging, hard to negotiate with these primal needs of our moon, our lunar needs. Mercury, not quite a deal breaker like the moon, but it can create a lot of challenges in all relationships. Communication is vital in relationships. Misunderstandings, as we know well, can create a lot of hurt. And a lot of energy and time lost in translation. Think of times where you, you know, try to explain things to somebody and it feels like you're on that hamster wheel of going round and round in circles. So communication, communication is a fundamental bridge. Keep in mind that Mercury describes how we process information as well as our communication style. It's about mutual understanding or not. And it's about the ability to bridge those differences. And it doesn't have to be through words. Sometimes going over and giving somebody a hug or holding their hand can be so much more of a bridge than actually speaking. Again, it depends on the moon. A moon in Earth may really value that. A moon in air may not. They may actually want to sit down and have a conversation. Sorry, Mercury in air may want a conversation. It's about an exchange. With Mercury, we exchange. This is who I am. This is who you are. How interesting. Let's learn about each other. It's the translator for the moon. It's also got the function of helping us to create memories with each other. 
think of mercury we create memory memories through communication whether it's through words whether it's through sign language whether it's through touch whether it's through music think of people even who have alzheimer's my my late dad had alzheimer's and he didn't have of course short-term memory but he recognized music on the radio so the power of that, and that was a way in to then chat to him about his childhood, his growing up years, he used to love to dance. So it's amazing what Mercury, the mercurial function can do. It's very, very crucial. So ways we can bridge this mercury, these mercurial differences. Fire and water plus air and water. Best to communicate face to face because the differences are quite big. So avoid communicating anything other than face to face. Fire and earth plus air and earth. Very good to communicate in writing. It can really be helpful. And if you're, I say this to couples, when I work with couples in psychotherapy, I ask them permission to look at their charts. I don't bring it into the session unless that's what they're there for. But if they're there just for therapy, in the background, I am looking at their mercury. I'm looking at all their chart. But I'm looking at what are ways that I can support them in communicating. And if one has, if they have one person has a mercury and fire and the other in earth, the mercury and fire person can be really fast and throw things out. And then they don't remember the next day what they said. The earth person, guaranteed the earth mercury, has can remember word for word what was said. So what I suggest is communicate in writing. Then they can go back to the fire person and say, look, this is what you said. And the fire person can say, oh, gosh, yeah, thank you for reminding me. Because it's not about doing things on purpose. It's just what we do naturally. Important. I cannot stress this enough. Avoid text and Facebook Messenger, any other kind of WhatsApp or anything for any important message in relationships. This is an area that is too vulnerable and it's so easy to have misunderstandings with close friends as well. If it's anything vulnerable, avoid it. Not a good way to communicate. Venus compatibility. Now we're in a range of places where it gets a little more bridgeable. It's not as personal as the moon and Mercury. This is all about self-value. We know Venus and the importance, the, the, it's I, the cliche of valuing ourselves cannot be underestimated in relationships. Self-value is directly linked to self-respect. And if we have strong self-value, we recognize a lack of respect from others. So that's very important. It doesn't mean our self-value is 10 out of 10 all the time, but really to notice where you're at and what's happening and to do things that really support you in developing that for yourself. Very, very important. Venus is also what and who we value and find beautiful. Think of when you're walking in, around an art gallery. What pictures are you drawn to? Very important. Self-value helps us clarify, define what we find attractive of ourselves and beautiful outside. Do we need to share it by element with somebody else? Not necessarily. I mean, but it's kind of nice if we do, but it's not something that we have to have because we can express it in a multitude of ways. Venus is also our relationship to finances. This is a subject that doesn't often come up in compatibility, yet it's so crucial. Finances can create differences in approach to finances, can create huge, huge ruptures in relationships. So really knowing what what do finances mean to me how are they related to my self value what do i value do i value having a really big savings account in the bank even if it means i can't go on holidays this year or does it mean that actually as long as i've got enough to pay my bills i i just want to enjoy money because life is short that's an important thing to look at the differences how do you bridge that gulf and i've seen couples bridge it really well that one person is the saver the other person is the spender so they decide that okay you're good at saving but you know we need to agree that we're also going to do these things to enjoy ourselves so once you talk about them back to mercury there's a lot of ways of bridging those differences one i think there was something else i wanted to say um no that's okay Okay, Mars compatibility. Like Venus, Mars can be bridged a lot more easily than the Moon and Mercury. 
Although there's one area that is probably less negotiable, which is if we have that spark with somebody else, desire and sexual drive. Now, that also can change over time. So something that can be heartbreaking for couples, and I'm talking about romantic couples, when they come in and they say, but, you know, she or he or they seem so in love with me at the start. And now I feel like they don't even want to come near me. And we need to acknowledge that that changes over time. I mean, think of just physical changes. If you're in pain, if you're going through menopause, if you're going through a bereavement, if you're going through grief at loss of virility or loss of your job or whatever, then desire and sexual drive are very connected to those. So it's very important to talk to clients about that, to say, hey, there's a lot of things that could be at play here. It may be that that has changed towards you, but it may be that it has nothing to do with you. Um, Self-assertion, how we assert ourselves. So how do we, and back to desire as well, just keep in mind that different Mars have different needs in their desire nature. Mars in Earth is much more um, sensual, probably than, well, not probably, definitely, unless depending on aspects, to a Mars in air that needs a lot of communication. So that's important to translate that via Mercury with your partner, with the people that are important to you. Self-assertion, very, very important. It's a key to allowing differentiation, which prevents the perceived loss of a sense of self. If we are not able to assert ourselves, it's very easy to feel we're losing ourselves in this relationship. And that is really scary to everyone because maintaining ourselves is crucial. That's, that's our journey. We're born alone, we die alone. We have to be our own person. How we assert ourselves depends on our Mars. And translating those different styles can be incredibly helpful to couples. So if you have Mars and Libra, you may really struggle to side entirely with your partner because that Mars and Libra sees both sides of the situation. Now, if your partner has a Mars and Scorpio, they're not going to take kindly to that because loyalty is paramount. So understanding that it's not that your partner isn't standing by you, it's that their Mars is different, is going to be incredibly helpful and avoid a lot of pain. Also, conflict resolution styles, very, very important. All relationships have conflicts. I worry when couples come to me in psychotherapy and say, oh, well, we, we, never, we never fight. And then this big rupture has happened. It's like a volcano disagreements um things we we that get on our nerves about the other person doesn't mean we tell them everything but when there's a conflict a disagreement over something we need to have the tools to deal with it and mars in water and mars in earth may struggle to express themselves when they're upset meanwhile the mars in fire and mars in air particularly if they also have a mercury in fire and air is talking away and dealing with things so time, space can be very helpful for Mars in air and uh, Mars in earth and water to regroup, to clarify what they disagree with. So um, if not, sometimes we find, of course, unhelpful tools and we all know how insidious and destructive passive aggressiveness is or sulking or silence. Um, in Ireland, that is probably how Mars used to be used the most in marriages and close relationships, the silent treatment, which was incredibly destructive. People wouldn't talk for months on end, and it just corroded and eroded the possibility of creating a bridge. There is no bridge at the end of that. The ascendant and descendant axis, the axis of incarnation and relating to others. So this is me and the other. We all start, as I said, and end with ourselves, the ascendant, our birth, also, new starts, new beginnings, including relationships. Who am I versus who are you through the lens of who I am? The more we understand our ascendant, the easier it is to see the lens through which we view the other, which is the descendant. The descendant is that part of us that is so hard for us to see. So we learn about it through the other person. They reflect it back to us. And initially can be really easy to project it onto another person. For example, if you've got Virgo ascendant, Pisces descendant, it's like other people seem to disappear. 
And then eventually the person might own it and say, oh, maybe maybe it's me that that is disappearing or wants them to disappear. So look at your patterns in relationships over the years. What are you learning? Back to compatibility being about learning and growth. So understanding our ascended can help us to get a sense also of what is the start of a relationship like for me? If you've got a Capricorn ascendant, chances are the new beginnings need to really be step by step. You, you, you feel better putting the foundations in, putting the structure in. If you've got a Leo ascendant, then you're more likely to really enjoy things starting quickly. But then you might suddenly wake up one morning and think, oh, my goodness, what am I doing in this relationship? So it helps us to get a sense of what works for us and to really make a choice. You know, OK, I'm a fire ascendant, but actually this relationship kind of feels good. So maybe I'm going to just take it a little more slowly so it doesn't burn out. And remember that the descendant and planets in the seventh house also give us information on our experience of our parental our childhood relationships, whoever was in those parental roles, doesn't mean it was necessarily our parents, but whoever were the caregivers. So it's what was role modeled for us. Okay, so we come to the tools of synastry and composite, and then I'm going to stop again for some questions. So do put your questions in the chat box. Synastry, as we all know, is the overlap of two charts. We know that it's very immediate. It happens instantly. You could be in the supermarket and you suddenly, somebody is near you and you suddenly think, uh-uh, don't want to stand here, stand somebody else, somewhere else. That is synastry. Or you might see somebody across a room at a party or a dinner or something and you think, oh, I really want to talk to that person. Nowadays, it's probably online. It's like you see somebody online, you think I want to chat with them. So it's that immediate connection. So here we have elemental similarities and differences we talked about. These are the things we're looking at. We look at the cross aspects that feel supportive and the cross aspects that feel challenging. We're looking at the cross aspects between personal planets and to and from the personal and the transpersonal. So we're looking at both which planets are in an aspect and what is the nature of the aspects. And we all know with synastry that conjunctions are always very powerful. That person's planet is literally landing on our planet and holding hands with our planet. We cannot avoid it when we're around them. So that's great at the start, but then after a while, that may not be so comfortable. Um, interestingly, Chiron cross aspects can be quite helpful in terms of healing, but they can feel a little ouchy at times. And what are we looking for in synastry? Well, if there's really we're looking for a balance of ease and challenges that help us grow. So not too comfortable. So we're like a pair of old trainers, but equally not too challenging where we feel like we're on a roller coaster the whole time. That gets exhausting. Eventually, that's hard to sustain. And what may feel like passion initially or a fantasy of passion, eventually when it starts getting in, into you know, our, our workspace, our family space, our friendship space, it's exhausting. So this is just a reminder. A lot of my work as a couples therapy and a relationship therapist is reminding couples that you're on the same team. That is so important because sometimes it can feel almost like it becomes this polarization of me and her or me and him or me and they and there isn't that sense of unity. So whether you're a couple or a triple or non-monogamous, non whatever kind of relationships you're in, you're in the same team. That is crucial. So we come to the composite chart. And I use the midpoint composite chart. Use whatever composite chart feels best for you. I've tried the Davidson and the midpoint. I keep coming back to the midpoint for myself. But this is literally the two charts combined together, the two, let me get the nice little laser pointer, the two individual charts create a third entity. Keep in mind this third entity is an independent third entity. The composite is not as immediate as the synastry. It takes time. We do need the exact times of birth to get an accurate composite. 
keep in mind that the composite is the relation is the chart of the relationship so it's not personal to each individual yet each person needs to relate to this chart and i've done several talks and i do it as well for relationships and astrology on the synastry between the individual and the composite chart that's part of level three of our course where we look at how important is it for each individual to relate to the composite chart and let me tell you it really is important and that is why sometimes people get on when they're not really at the beginning of a relationship when they're not living together and then suddenly they move in and they think it's about the washing up getting done or the bin being taken out but actually it's that they're in the composite chart and it's how they each relate to the composite chart so we look at again the elemental balance always 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 very very important we look at the busy houses in the composite chart we look at the sun and the nodes the sun in the composite chart gives us a lot of information about the purpose of their relationship and so do the nodes the angles are also very interesting because they often describe that's why we need the exact times of birth because they describe how the couple met Remember that the composite is a much more literal chart. It's, it's hard to psychoanalyze a composite chart. It's a literal chart of the relationship itself. So I'm going to stop at this point before we go into example charts to ask for comments or thoughts or questions. Thank you, Margaret. We have a very active chat, so I will apologize in advance. We're probably not going to get to every question, but thank you for posing your questions. A really good question here. Do you think that we are drawn to people who have elements in the, uh, in the chart that we are missing? Absolutely. I really think I feel that very strongly, and I've tracked that in charts over the years, and I've noticed that a lot. It's a natural attraction, but the thing, the key is, I always say to people, learn from the person with that element. Do not lean on them. It's a little bit like um, I'm pretty dire at maths, and so I'm always attracted to people who are very good with numbers. But if I don't become good with numbers, then it's going to be really hard when I have to do my tax returns. And that's a true story, by the way. But so it's literally you know translating that into elements so if somebody has a lot of earth in their chart and the other person doesn't have any earth be careful that you don't become the person to do all the practical things and the other person doesn't because if you split up or sadly if one of you passes away they're going to have to learn to do it and also because it's never about you know we're, we're here to complete ourselves as the amazing spiritual beings in human form that we are we're here to become whole to learn through this human experience. And so our relationships are part of that learning and they're like a gift to learn from. And so if the other person has that element, look at them, be curious. Um, you know, if you don't have a lot of air, be curious about people who have a lot of air. Notice how, you know, it might be easy for them to stand up and communicate. It may not be a challenge, ask them about it, but make sure that you're developing your own air at the same time. Absolutely wonderful. A very shameless pitch. We covered this in 101. So if you want to sign up for that as well, that'd be wonderful. <laughs> great, sorry, great. On, on, to the, on to the next shameless pitch. I'm sorry. On to the next question. What if the moons are, in quotes, incompatible, are in com incompatible signs, but each person's moon is conjunct to, say, another's Venus or North Node? I mean, I think this is really speaking to the complexity in the art of astrology. But what are your thoughts on that? I think that really, really helps. And you'll see that in the example charts. I think that really helps incredibly. But I think it's back to really being aware. If you know what your partner's moon is and what they need or what your child's moon is. Um, for example, this is an example I use often because I got permission to use it. A friend of mine, um, her moon is in Taurus and her child's moon is in Gemini. And when her child was small, she would come home from school really upset. And because the mother's moon was in Taurus, she would make her like, you know, something to drink, hot chocolate or cookies or whatever. But actually what the child wanted to do was to talk. And so once I explained, of course, to, to the mum how their moons were different, she realized that she had no idea. She was meeting the child's lunar needs and the way she wanted hers met. And then she started talking to her. So she knew enough to put her own lunar needs aside and sit with the child. Now, that's not always easy to do if we're both feeling, you know, if you're both feeling upset, you both want your needs met. But that's where it's really important to 
first of all, know how to take care of our own lunar needs as adults. We're no longer children, so we need to know how to self-soothe and self nurture and then we can ask but also accept that the other person may not be able to do it at that point in time but definitely if there are aspects to maybe venus or maybe to our ascendant or to our sun if we have something in common again we're looking at where can we create a bridge between the people absolutely wonderful and um, some of common questions coming up here does the the sun moon compatibility compensate for say other difficult aspects that might be going on in the charts. I think you might have talked about this as well, but um, if, if say in the sinistry, the sun and moon compatibility is, is very nice and you have other harsh aspects going on, how do you deal with that? I, I, I'm I not sure if you're asking about sun, moon, sinistry aspects, which traditionally were considered compatible. I'm not so sure I would consider them that compatible. So I'm going to address that first in case that's what you're asking. Because the sun of one person aspecting the moon of another basically highlights the other person's moon. And it all depends on what their lunar experience was like. If they had a very challenging childhood lunar experience and their moon feels a little vulnerable, it may not feel so pleasant to have somebody else's sun on it. So that's the first thing. If you mean that there's a good sun to sun compatibility and moon to moon, then I think it really goes a long way to making up for other challenges. And I think if you can throw in a mercury compatibility there as well, I think that really would be a really, you know, would be really, really helpful. But again, remember, compatibility, we're talking about what age are the individuals, where, what stage of life are they at? What do they want? Do they want a relationship where there's a lot of growth? Or do they want a relationship that is companionship? And everybody is very different. In all the years I've worked with couples, either through astrology or psychotherapy, the needs of couples, aside from the fundamental need, of course, of being loved, but the need of the nature of the relationship is very, very different. And, you know, we're going into a whole new area where, thankfully, all kinds of relationships are opening up, possibilities are opening up. So it all depends what kind of relationship you want. But yes, in general, to kind of not have too much conflict, it really helps to have um moon you know lunar compatibility and ideally mercurial compatibility wonderful and maybe two more quick questions and we'll move Absolutely. on uh, yeah sorry yeah. Oh, <laughs> um, and in terms of orbs if you're using a uh, Compton or davison whichever relationship techniques you're using what orbs are you using in your work you know i'm quite generous with orbs how i describe orbs is if the orb is very tight it's like saying a conjunction if the orb is a couple of degrees it's like that planet is sitting right next they're sitting right next to each other so you feel that energy very very closely if the orb is further away you still feel their energy but not as not as much so that's how i treat orbs so i look at even the wide ones and i think that's kind of interesting but i think they're they're felt a little less now it depends also what they are you know what the planets are so that's a wider question to do with the energies of the planets looking at what you're looking for in the sinistry or the composite chart Wonderful. And there's a few questions about uh, houses. So in terms of compatibility in the houses and how they put together, I think you've alluded to some of this before. So just maybe thoughts on compatibility in the houses. Let me address that when we're looking actually at the example charts, if that's OK, because okay. I think that may be helpful with with looking at the practical kind of application. Is there anything else that's theoretical to do with what we've covered so far that anybody would like. Wonderful. And maybe a last question here. What programs do you prefer to use? Software? Software. I use Solar Fire. Um, I've got a PC and I've used Solar Fire for years and I personally love it. But I know there are so many good programs out there. So use whatever works for you. But I would certainly say that I know there's free programs online. And when you're starting off, it's great to get them because, of course, they don't cost any money. But if you intend to take astrology up seriously, do make sure you get a good program because it really will make your life so much easier. So it's worth all the money if you're using it on a regular basis, whichever program. And I think they're all pretty excellent now. 
Wonderful. And I said, we've got so many questions coming in, so maybe we'll do an, an extra Q&A towards the end as well. So, <laughs> Oh, absolutely. We will. No worries about that. Let me go on to our example charts. So um, I was drawn to look at the chart of King Frederick and Queen Mary of Denmark, not because I'm a royalist, um, but because I think it's very interesting when people are in the news and when we know a little bit about their lives. And for those of you who are not familiar with this royal family of Denmark, they were just recently crowned king and queen. He is the son of the um, the queen who was there, who abdicated. Now we don't have a time of birth for Queen Mary, but she was she's from Australia, from Tasmania, so she's a very interesting person. I thought it'd be interesting to just look at their relationship um, and see what is it like now that they've stepped into a role which is a pretty major role. So we don't know her ascend and we don't know her houses. So let's look at the elements and you can see I've put the elements here it makes it very easy for everyone to see them. We can see at a glance that they both have a lot of air. So different signs but similar energies and both have sun and moon in, sun and moon in air. Now he's more likely to carry the earth, <clears throat> excuse me, as he has um, Venus there as well as um, his ascendant. So here we see that he's got Earth, which is ruled by Saturn. Notice that her Saturn is her only Earth. Sorry, have I higher Earth? Yes, Saturn is her only Earth. Um, okay, the element that's the weakest, sorry, I got a bit lost myself here. The element that's weakest for both of them is water, but she's got Venus and water. So I'm really looking more at the personal planets in the elements, because those are the ones that we're more aware of immediately. We're kind of live with them every day. The transpersonal planets, of course, are generational planets, so we are not as deeply connected with them. So let's look, start with the moon. We can see that his moon is conjunct his sun here in Gemini. Um, he's a new moon child, expressing his emotions very important for him because it's conjunct to Mars. We can see that also his moon aspects his Chiron. So now we also can see this is where we start looking at progressions. If you're an introductory level astrologer, don't worry too much about this. But for anybody who's been practicing astrology a while, you know how important progressions are. And to the moon, we look at them in terms of months. So with moon Chiron, we know here that something happened when he was about a month old. We don't know what that is, but if he was in the room with us, I'd be saying, what happened to you? There's some experience of some kind of for him, it felt like wounding or maybe a perception through his mother. That's important to know because moon Chiron aspects usually have a lot of empathy for others. So even though this is a moon in air, he's got a lot of empathy. Her moon is in Libra conjunct Uranus. So here we have a moon that is quite detached. We don't have an exact time of birth. So I can't really go into the progressions there because we don't know the exact degree of her moon. But again, it's a moon in air. So again, both of them, moon and Libra can be very social, like space and connection, equality matters. All of those things are important and they share some of those things. His moon also aspects Neptune. So again, if we look at converse progression, this was something that was going on when he when he was still in the womb, which is really interesting. And his moon aspects Jupiter. So Jupiter, of course, expands everything. So this lunar need for communication is very much expanded in his chart and it, his Jupiter is in the seventh house of relationships. So he is likely to need an understanding of his lunar needs with that Jupiter there. For her, um, okay, we've moved on to Mercury here. Her Mercury is in Aquarius. Sorry, her Mercury, where am I? Yes, Mercury in Aquarius air. There is so much air in both these charts, which is probably the attraction to each other. Her, her Mercury is also conjunct her North Node here. So this is her journey. She needs to communicate. She needs a way to communicate 
that very much is about thinking outside the box. Mercury in Aquarius is very egalitarian. It's very idealistic. His Mercury here is in Gemini, and he also has a Mercury-Uranus aspect. That's very interesting because we were somebody was asking about when there are, you know, bridges in terms of planets having aspects. And here we have already they're pretty compatible with two Mercuries in air. But the fact that her Mercury in Aquarius kind of resonates with his Mercury Uranus Pluto. He is the Uranus Pluto conjunction generation, of course, which is about creating innovation and creating change. This is in his seventh house of relationship, which is kind of interesting because when you see a Pluto Uranus um, conjunction in the house relationships, then I would wonder how is that lived out? How does he deal with power issues? How does he deal with innovation? So chances are that all of this needs to be acknowledged and he needs an avenue to express this with his Mercury. He also has Mercury Jupiter, so expansive Mercury. Now we're on to Mars. And I'm sorry, I'm not going into detail with everything, but I have quite a few examples I want to get through. So I want to make sure we get them some main things across that might be helpful to you. Her Mars in Aries, his Mars is in Gemini. So again, different energies, but compatible. Both of them like change, easily bored. She has a Mars trying Jupiter in Sag, love of travel, love of learning. And look how far she's come from Tasmania all the way to Denmark. His Mars here is, did we have a Mars? No, no, we're still on her Mars. Okay. Her Mars also aspects her nodes and Mercury. So she needs to express that drive. Remember, we don't know her house system. We don't know what house that Mars is in, but it's a very driven Mars. Great for leadership in the role she's in now. Looking at the suns, both of them have sun in air. Her son is in Aquarius. Again, that desire to do something for the collective, to do something outside the box. His is in Gemini. Now, she has a son Chiron aspect. Traditionally, this is considered the wounded healer, somebody whose life trajectory has probably had quite a few obstacles and that part of their journey is to help heal others. And her Chiron is an Aries, so maybe a sense within herself in some area of her life that she felt disempowered. And here is her son Chiron, that part of her purpose is to help others, to help improve, empower the collective. Now, he also has a son, oops, went back. He also actually has a son Chiron aspect. You can see it here. So he too is the healer. And he too has that Chiron in Aries. So both of them have that sense of needing. Their life purpose is about empowering people. It'll be very interesting to see how they express that in their current role, because they certainly have a lot of power at their disposal to do that. This is the sinistry. Remember, we've no angles for her, no time of birth. So immediately, the first thing we can see here is that her Saturn is conjunct this stellium in his chart. Now, Saturn aspects, and we talked about this in terms of longevity, they can provide the sticking glue. But also Saturn requires the other person to manifest something. So this may be of help to him in terms of really pushing him to manifest his thoughts, manifest his words, manifest his skills. However, for her, if you look at it the other way around, his son and her Saturn may not always feel so pleasant because it shines a light on her Saturnian complexes. In this case, her complexes are around feeling of value, Saturn in Taurus about, uh, am I of value? How do I value myself? And that's also about, can I trust that there will be abundance in the world? A fear of lack of abundance, a fear of lack of grounding. And that is her only earth. So one of the things in her chart is grounding. Sorry to interrupt, Margaret, because we're getting so many questions on this. Uh, which house system are you using? Placidus. Thank you. <laughs> sure, absolutely. Apologies. I should have said that at the start. Um, 
Okay, also the conjunction. Notice that I first always go to the conjunction. When I'm looking at synastry, I go to where is my eye drawn immediately? And usually it's the conjunctions. So her moon Uranus is conjunct his south node. Opposite this north node Saturn conjunction in Aries. So effectively his Saturn opposes her moon. Again, we're not sure the time of birth, but you can see how there is this complex configuration. And one thing I should say at this point is that often in the charts of people who do have a relationship over an extended time is that there are a lot of sinistry aspects. Not all of them easy necessarily at all, but there are aspects that link us in so that there is that interaction. And here is this powerful Saturn to this moon Uranus. And here is this moon Uranus to a south node. So for people who believe in past lives, connections, past life connections also. Again, we have here um, a connection between her Mars and his Saturn. Now, this may not feel so pleasant because Saturn Mars aspects sometimes can be the Saturn person can help the Mars person to manifest, but sometimes it can also feel like they're a bit of an obstacle. So we don't know without talking to them as a couple, be interesting to say, hey, do you feel that his Saturn on your Mars has helped you to be more of what you want to do or do more of what you want to do? Or has it been an obstacle? We don't know that without asking them. And that's an important thing with um, Sinistry, never to make assumptions because we never have any idea. And it's always very interesting to find out when we meet a couple. Um, her Neptune, why did I put this? Yes, her Neptune on his MC. So her generational dreams of finding the truth connect with who he needs to be out in the world, which is so interesting. Now, notice also how her son lands in his first house. So what he's here to develop, the house of new beginnings, of new self-discovery, very, very important. Also, there are some interesting Pluto aspects here. So her Pluto aspects his son, trines his son, Venus, moon, stellium. So her Pluto requires, invites some transformation, and his son wakes up her Pluto need for self-empowerment. Again, we don't really know what that feels like without asking them. Her Pluto also opposes his Chiron in Aries. That is less of a big thing. That is less, they're less likely to feel that. But I just threw it in because I wanted to throw in an example of not the personal planets. Um, also, I just want to say a little bit about them. Basically, um, he was, he is quite an adventurer. Apparently, he took part, he became a member of the Danish Navy Frogmen Corps, and he roughly comparable to the US Navy SEALs. So very much uh, a daredevil. Um, he is quoted as saying, I will not be given things on a plate or, plate or be shut in a castle. I want to try myself out and find myself. I will be a human being. Just that gives you a little bit about him. Now, she was the youngest of four children. Her father was a professor of mathematics. Her parents emigrated from Scotland to Tasmania, and she spent a lot of her childhood in the US. Her father's job took them around. I think when we were talking about movement and freedom, she has a double degree in law and commerce, worked in real estate until 2002, and then moved to Copenhagen for a job in Microsoft. She met, when she met him, she didn't know who he was. So this is really a match of two people who did not know each other when they met. Okay, now another royal couple, you're probably all sick to the teeth of them, but I thought it would be good to bring them in because they both left, or he left, they both really left their careers actually for each other. She's no longer acting. And I love the laughter, I know. And um, he left his role in the royal family. So you're probably pretty familiar with them, but just a quick look through them. He has low water, strong earth, no personal planets in water. Saturn is his complex because, and that is his, part of his water, so he's got to work on it. So it's likely that she carries the water, even though she is just one personal planet in water. 
her chart is fairly balanced. He has a little more Earth. She only has Venus and Chiron in Earth. And she has a little more fire than him, although his Mars in fire is pretty feisty. So let's take a look at these two. And the part of the reason I wanted to use them is that they have their moon in very different elements. So we were talking about compatibility and bridges. Here is a moon in Libra, her moon, and conjunct Saturn versus a moon in Taurus. However, both of them are ruled by Venus, but they are very different energies. Her moon in Libra wants balance, even though the Saturn adds a little bit of Earth. And his moon in Taurus is much more practical, much more physically based, sensually based, um, practical gifts based. So she's also got Jupiter there in Libra. So a little harsh, that Saturn aspect there. She has a need for fairness, equality, balance. That's pretty crucial for her. And here is the aspect between her moon and her north node and her Mercury. So she needs to really express feelings. And there's quite a difference between that moon in Libra wanting balance and that stellium in Leo that really wants to take action and leadership. Now, for him, let's look at the aspects. He has a moon Libra, now a moon Neptune. This is very interesting because the moon Neptune, again, if you progress, it was when he was about four months old. And when I did a little bit of research, I found out that his mother was on a big trip to Italy. Then Princess Diana was on a bad six week trip to Italy without her children at that time. So you can see how for him that registered as an experience of abandonment. Now, of course, this is his moon Neptune, so he needed something to project it on. So this was how he experienced it. But interesting to look at that because that is part of his psyche. And it will be interesting to say, how does that come out for you in your relationships? He also has a moon sun aspect. So his emotions are tied to his identity. Very, very important. Um, now, did I put anything else about the moon? No, okay. So we're on to Mercury. She has Mercury in Leo, very different Mercury to his in Virgo. Mercury in Leo conjunct her sun conjunct her north node. She needs to speak her truth to be her individual self. He has a Mercury in Virgo in the eighth house. He needs to be of service. He's very detail oriented, words mean. And we've seen a lot of that with the court cases, how angry he's been when his words have been used in ways that he wasn't comfortable with. Um, he also has a moon Pluto aspect. This is a Pluto in Scorpio. He wants the absolute truth. He needs the truth. That is crucial. And I'm talking not about him as a person. I don't know him. I'm talking about his chart. These are the things I would be asking him if he were in the room with us. Also, he's got a Mercury Uranus. So thinking outside the box, that is more likely to resonate with her Mercury in Leo fire, that Uranian, even though it's different, but there is that Uranus and Sagittarius freedom, and at times maybe shocking people, and a Mercury-Jupiter. Her Mercury, oh, her Mars is in the 12th house. Notice how her Mars is in Cancer. This is her water in the 12th house. So this is something ancestrally that she has to reclaim. His Mars is actually in, in um, Sagittarius. So he's got a much feistier Mars than she has. And it's aspecting his moon. So here is where his moon gets a little bit of feistiness, a little bit of fire from that Mars. Um, also, he's got a Mars Venus. So his values have to align with his actions. And he's got a Mars sun. How he takes action is very linked to his identity. An interesting thing for her is that her Mars aspects her MC. And you can see that in her acting. Mars in Cancer is incredibly creative. It will be interesting to see how she expresses that now in their marriage when she doesn't have access to that same approach to creativity. Let's look quickly at their synastry. Immediately, we can see her Mars conjuncts his descendant, awakens what he finds attractive, 
also opposite his ascendant. So it nudges him into who he is, his physical being. Her Venus. Um, let's have a look. Yes, his Jupiter is on her Venus. So it really connects with her values. Very, very important. Now, her sun aspects his Mars Uranus. So her sun in Leo activates, illuminates this drive for truth, for beliefs. Now, whether we agree with him or not, this is his chart of what the potential is, of what it is seeking to express. How he chooses to do it, of course, is him as a human. Here we have also an aspect between her, her son and her son Mercury and his Chiron. So here is the potential for some understanding of his wound. This is important. Notice his Chiron in Gemini. He doesn't feel heard and understood. So this can be challenging. And here comes her son Mercury who can give a voice to that, or that's the hope potentially. Um, her sun aspects his Saturn. There is the longevity aspect, but also it shines a light on his Saturn in Scorpio. The feeling that nothing and no one can be trusted. That's a very strong aspect in the chart. And we have an aspect between his Pluto and her North Node. So here are his um, generational, his generational need for truth, for challenging taboos aligns and connects with her north node in Leo, being truthful. Finally, here we have a Chiron moon conjunction. Chiron moon conjunctions are incredibly helpful. There can be a lot of empathy and kindness by the moon person towards the Chiron. In this case, it's from him towards her, but there is also, in fact, a Chiron moon aspect between her chart and his chart. So you can see how there are these cross aspects that can really support them. Now, I want to go on to, you can look at these other aspects yourself. Um, I want to very quickly look at their composite chart to look at similarities and differences. Here you can see that the composite gives him water. There's moon Jupiter. So it takes the burden off her to carry the water. This composite sun here is the purpose of the relationship, and it's a sun in Virgo. So this is the sun that he can relate to, the same sign. The moon sign of the composite can relate to her Mars. Very different to both their moons in air and earth, but here is a connection, a bridge. Mercury in Leo is also resonates with her Mercury in Leo. Let's see if I put that in somewhere. Um, Venus is the same as his Venus. You can see here is the Venus in Libra, same as his Venus in Libra. And the Mars is actually, the composite Mars is conjunct his sun. So here we can see that the nodes in the composite chart all about in Cancer, self-value or sorry, self-love, which is really where this relationship needs to be heading to towards, towards purpose and self-love. Sorry if these are coming up in the wrong order. I have no idea what happened. I was probably working on the links when all the Uranian planets were in action. Okay, I, I'm going to skip through these because I know we don't have enough time to do them. My apologies, but I am going to, this was Jodie Foster and her current wife, um, you can certainly look at these yourself. I want to very quickly do a little sales pitch. My apologies for this. If you're interested in relationship astrology, we're doing the three day intensive next weekend. You can still sign up, followed by level two and three. We have three levels. This is the first one and we would love you to join us. So um, thank you for joining me. I'm going to make space now for questions. There's lots of time. I want to leave you with this quote. What is life without incompatible realities? I just love this quote. So um, are there questions, Callum? They are plenty and plenty of questions. Thank you so much, Margaret. And on behalf of Kepler College for such a, a beautiful and wonderfully insightful presentation. Thank you so much. 
It's a pleasure. I am trying to stop sharing, but I can't see where I can do that. So I am struggling with that. Um, I think it should be at the bottom of your screen. And also uh, oh, stop share. There we go. Yes, I'm back. OK, perfect. <laughs> yes. Wonderful. I've turned purple. I don't know what's going on here. We've uh, all the hearts and the, I don't know if you can see all the emojis. Coming yes, that was so <laughs> nice. Thank you, everyone. That was just delightful. Thank you. And yes, what are the questions? Let's 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 so let's get... dive into some of the questions oh. here. Um, one of the, some of them that came through before. Do you use midpoints in your work? Um, I do sometimes, but not a lot. To be honest, there is so much else that's there and so much information. Um, I try, I do sometimes if there's nothing else, but there's rarely nothing else. Um, so I find I try not to get overwhelmed sometimes with so much there because it's really trying to extricate what is useful for the clients. But if you're somebody who likes midpoints, by all means, do use them. Absolutely wonderful. And this is really quite an interesting question. So, for example, if you have two couples and they say they have the lights, the sun and the moon in the same sign, now, does that work better in terms of familiarity or is maybe does that work well as they've got merging energies in terms of the polarity, the element and the mode? Or is there something to work out there? What are, what are your experiences in terms of couples maybe sharing the same signs as the... You know, that's such an interesting one. And I think there are some signs that do very well together. I have often seen Scorpios together, sun sign Scorpio, and they seem to really, really relate with each other. Um, with Aries, I've seen a lot of friendships, Aries friendships. I know myself, I've had a lot of Aries friends. As partners, it's a little competitive. Fire signs together can be a lot of fun, but a little competitive as partners. Um, Capricorns sometimes can do well together if they don't get too stuck. I think it really depends what else in the chart. But I think, you know, certainly for friendships, it can work really well. It, it depends. As I say, I think earth and air and water signs probably do better together. I think fire signs together. I think they can work together if they agree to support each other and to egg each other on. But I think if it becomes like, you know, too competitive, then it can be quite destructive. That's my experience of working with couples anyway. So sometimes if there's too much fire between the two charts, then there's a lot of competitive. It kind of ties into another question here of what part of the chart would indicate competitiveness and power struggles within a relationship? You know, sometimes... I think with power struggles, let me address that first. If you have Pluto in the seventh house of relationships, power issues need to be addressed in relationships. It doesn't mean you're going to abuse your power, but you cannot ignore the issue of power. I mean, power is a dynamic for all of us. Self-empowerment is crucial. And that's an interesting thing. It came up the other day. I was talking to somebody and saying how in Ireland, when I mention power, people get kind of almost like, oh, no, I, I don't want power because our experience as a country has a colonized country has been of being overpowered. When I mention power to U.S. clients are like, yeah, great, lovely. Yeah. How can I do that? So I let's talk about power of self-empowerment, but also power that needs to always be acknowledged, how we're using it individually and how we're using it as a couple. When it's in the seventh house or in the eighth house, but first the seventh house, it really needs to be addressed because that is the place that we don't always see how we're projecting those energies onto someone else. So we may be projecting our unresolved power issues onto the other person. So very, very important for that to be looked at. Um, I think Mars Pluto issues, also Mar Mars Pluto aspects in the chart need to always be, we need to be conscious of them, we need to address them, because sometimes we can project one part of it onto the other person, particularly if either the Mars or the Pluto are in the 12th house. The 12th house, I think, can be such a hidden house. With Pluto in the 12th house, what can happen is that sometimes we are the scapegoat for other people's power issues. So I think those are some of the core things to look at in terms of power that I would look at myself. It's quite interesting you're talking about that because another question in terms of your thoughts on 12th and 8th house, sinistry overlay. So a lot of maybe sinistry planets in the, in the 8th or the 12th, and you've kind of alluded to that, but that was another question that came in as well. It, 
it's such an interesting area. Um, I always find the eighth and the twelfth fascinating as houses because the eighth, <clears throat> excuse me. I regard the eighth house as the house of kind of family secrets and the house of what we really, really need to become conscious of in our own chart. It's I describe it as the house that we have absorbed those planets from family, but we want to do them differently. So if we are unconscious, they're going to come at us in a lot of ways until we learn about them. And the eighth is also the house of transformation. So we're constantly regenerating, transforming. So if you are involved with somebody who has a lot of planets in their eighth house, they are going to constantly be transmuting themselves, particularly their sun or their moon. So they are not, they are going to want to grow all the time. So they are unlikely to be able to tolerate a relationship that is fairly long-term static. Not that it, that's good for anyone, but some, some charts really are, can kind of, you know, go along. Um, the 12th house is a little bit different because the 12th house to me is the ancestral house, the transpersonal house. It's the house of being incredibly psychic and perceptive of everything that's going on. Um, everywhere. And so for the person themselves, they're constantly having to separate. Is this me or is this the collective? Um, particularly if the moon is there. Um, is this Are these my feelings or other people's feelings? Is that is Pluto is there? Is this my power or other people's power? And so if you're involved with them in a relationship, they're constantly struggling with that and, and figuring that out. So it's not that they're lying to you as they change and transform. It's just that they don't know themselves. And their son is constantly trying to find themselves. But if you think of the process of separation and individuation that requires that this is who I am, if your son is in the 12th, and all of you with your son in the 12th, you probably know, um, you know, you, it's very hard to say this is who I am because, yes, this is who I am, but actually I need to give up and then I need to find again who I am because tomorrow I will regenerate and recreate myself. It's like the Neptunian journey in the 12th versus the Plutonian journey in the 8th house. That's how I describe them. So if you are in a relationship with anybody with this kind of chart, you need to really know what's happening and they need to be very conscious. So... I really suggest to people with a lot of, you know, busy eighth house to be in therapy, to go to therapy and do that work, because that will really benefit the relationship as well as them. And with 12th house planets, I think somebody needs to ideally have some kind of spiritual path that will fulfill those 12th house needs. A relationship can't do that. Such a beautiful description. I think that's resonating with so many people in the chat and they're all putting in <laughs> through there. Absolutely wonderful. <laughs> I'm glad it helps. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm I'm like you. I'm, I'm I've got a bit of flu as well. So forgive me if I'm I'm coughing as well. This is more of a more of a spiritual and uh, philosophical question. So someone's put here that I heard that past life connections, uh, south node contacts, are meant to stay in the past life. So in this life, can it be a bit more destructive or uh, bring maybe issues to one another in, in terms of partnerships? I don't know if I'm framing that question right. You know, the answer is I don't know. None of us know. We're kind of all trying to figure that out. And um, I, I personally, and this is only my personal belief, I do personally believe we have past life connections with anybody we're close to in this lifetime. And I think the South Node and North Node can describe, sometimes can describe some of that. Um, I think, I, I think it depends how we work with that. You know, if we work with it in terms of saying, oh, this person did this to me, so now it's my turn to do it. I don't think that's really helpful. But I think if we work with it from a perspective of how amazing that we've met again and what is left for us to grow and develop together, then I think any connection can be helpful. So that's a very general answer, but that that's my personal perspective on it. Absolutely wonderful. And maybe the last question for today, and again, I will apologize for everyone who submitted their questions. There's so many, <laughs> we can't get to all of them, but Margaret, have you written any books on relationship astrology? And if not, uh, which books do you recommend? 
I am just in the process of finishing my book up, which has been a very, very long seven, eight years. So I will let you know about that when it finally, if it finally gets done and published. I'm a terrible procrastinator in terms of writing. Um, I think there are lots of books out there. I recommend you go to our Relationship and Astrology page. I think we may have a whole list of books there. If we don't, please feel free to email me and I'm happy to send you our book list there. It depends very much what aspect of relationship you're interested in. There's lots of good books out there. So, yeah, I but I'm very happy to send you our reading list. Absolutely. Well, Margaret, when you finish that book, send us the link and we'll put it through the, the description box on the chat box. <laughs> I'm sure everyone will be loving to get that. <laughs> you are very kind. And thank you so much, everyone, for being here. It's been such a joy. I love talking about relationships and astrology. And it's been such a delight to be back with you all at Kepler. Thank you so much. Absolutely wonderful. And again, on behalf of Kepler College, thank you so much, Margaret, for, again, a beautiful and insightful presentation. And thank you, everyone, for joining all around the world different time zones. Thank you so much. And I will reiterate, we'll post the replay of this webinar on our YouTube channel. Uh, I'll try and get to that in the next couple of days. So possibly Monday around noon Eastern. So it will be posted in the next few days. <laughs> and I just put the link. Oh, thank you, Margaret. I just want to say I put the link to your website in the chat box. It's a little bit up further now because of the, the chats. But if you want to grab that before we we click off just so you have it. It's there. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I'm I, we have relationships and astrology on Facebook, Instagram, and I'm on both Facebook and Instagram. So you'll get us in whichever way. So thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend. And Margaret as well, lastly, if you send us the links, I'll put them in uh, when you watch the YouTube replay. Uh, look in the description box and the comment box below. And we'll have all those links down below as well. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Thanks Wonderful. for joining us today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for, for joining in. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.